Hi, Christina. We're so glad to have you on our podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us. Marnie and I both just love meeting like-minded people who are really like dedicated their lives to helping others, especially those that may be underserved. And we're so happy that we connected online and we can't wait to share all the amazing work that you've been doing as a journalist um, to help us shift our focus and really start winning the war on cancer. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Great. So before we really dive into the interview and your book, we'd love to hear what is your one non-negotiable to start each day? Coffee. I'm sure that's the most <laughs> common answer. And I also it's, know it's, not. it's actually <laughs> not, not, no. not. No. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm uh I've had a long long relationship with coffee and sometimes I've had more of it in my life and sometimes less. And, um, I've definitely gone through periods where I was like, maybe this is not so good for me and I should switch to a nice matcha in the morning, but, um, I can't give it up. It's like one of those mild minor vices that I'm like, this is, there are worse things. (laughs) So I'm rolling with it. Um, (laughs) But I've got, I've cut down a lot since I was like in college, I'm like a two cup a day coffee drinker now in the morning and that's it. But it definitely helps me get moving. Yep. I I don't drink coffee, so I can't relate, but my husband does. My husband's drinking coffee again. It's happening. He is. But that's a different story. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) Anyway. Yeah. That's a topic for another day. That's a development. (laughs) Um, So Christina, we I mean, are so interested to hear, like in a nutshell, how you became so passionate about cancer prevention and the link between environmental toxins and cancer, and then what ultimately drove you to write your book, New War on Cancer. My younger sister was diagnosed with thyroid cancer when she was 25 years old, which is very young for a cancer diagnosis. And I was 27 at the time. We're close in age and we've always been really close. And I was living abroad, teaching English and trying to decide if I was going to stay another year or move back home to the United States. And when she got her diagnosis, um, that answered the question for me. So I I moved home. It's actually why I moved to Pittsburgh. She was in law school here at the time. And I moved in with her to help out um, through her surgery and her treatment. And um, my sister is doing great. She's been in remission for more than a decade. She still lives close by and she's married and has two super cute kids who I love being an aunt to. So she was one of the lucky ones for sure. But, um, when she got diagnosed, her doctors told us that thyroid cancer usually runs in families, that it was really rare for just one person in a family to get thyroid cancer. And no one else in our family has ever had it. Um, no one had had it before that. And no one has had it since then. Um, you know, my doctors got really nervous after that happened and I get checked regularly, um, to make sure my thyroid levels are okay. And they've always been fine. And her doctors also mentioned in this kind of offhanded way that, um, you know, since there was no family history, maybe she was exposed to something that could have, uh, factored into her thyroid cancer. And, When we pressed further about that, they didn't really have any more information to share. When we went Googling to try and figure out like what might have happened that could have caused this, um, we really had a hard time finding answers. And that's an experience a lot of people have when they get Mm -hmm. a cancer diagnosis like this, especially um, at, you know, such a, a relatively young age. And I'm also an investigative journalist. And a couple of years after my sister's surgery, I was still thinking about all that. Um, and I, I wrote a series of stories on um, cancer and the environment in Pittsburgh in Western Pennsylvania, which is where we live, uh, looking at how the region has higher than average rates of a handful of cancer types that are strongly linked to exposure to pollution. And I looked at how our um, industrial air pollution, which continues to be a problem in Pittsburgh, it's better than it used to be. You know, people are familiar with this kind of old timey image of Pittsburgh being enveloped in smoke. It used to be dark at noon and people had to change their shirts because of the soot. Um, Certainly our air is much better than that now, but we continue to have problems with industrial air pollution here. Um, So that was a big part of the stories. And I also looked at 
some of our water contaminants that could be contributing to these high cancer rates. And uh, the series uh, won a couple of awards and I got a really nice note from a publisher saying, congratulations on these awards. I think this reporting is really important. Would you have any interest in turning this into a book length project that's a national look at this problem? So um, this the book came very directly out of my reporting and the reporting was you know, inspired by my family's experience with um, cancer. And certainly we're not alone in that. A lot of, most of us, either ourselves or someone we know has had a brush with cancer at some point in our lives. What an amazing story. And it makes me think of Aaron Brockovich. I'm sure I'm not the first person that said that to you, but um, I'm wondering, are you still working in this field? I know your, your work as an investigative journalist, is this still a passion of yours or when once you completed the book, are you kind of moving on to other projects? Yeah, I still do this work uh, every day. So I work for an organization called Environmental Health Sciences, and uh, we publish environmental health news. And the parent organization was founded by a scientist who is an expert in endocrine disrupting chemicals. And mm -hmm. those are chemicals that are in all kinds of stuff that we come into regular contact with, things like parabens and BPA and uh, PFOS or forever chemicals. Um, and those chemicals interrupt our body's natural hormonal processes and they can cause lots of health problems, including raising our cancer risk. Um, so he founded the publication with the mission of, you know, helping get good science into regular people's hands so that we could use it to drive policy changes. Um, he realized there was a big gap between what scientists knew about these kinds of chemicals and what most people understood about what's safe and what's not safe when it comes to these chemicals we come into contact with in our daily lives. So I I am our um, Pittsburgh Bureau. I'm the whole Pittsburgh Bureau. It's just me. Um, so I still write a lot about how what's happening in the environment in Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania are impacting our health. And we have a national and international readership. So I generally try to tie those local stories into the bigger picture of, you know, how is what's happening happening here with PFAS, for example, or with um, rep replacing lead water lines. How is this similar to or different from what other cities have done? Are there other cities that are doing a better job and have found better solutions than the ones we're looking at? And then also, um, you know, how does, how do the issues that we're facing here fit in with the kind of global scale of this problem? I mean, wow, because this, I just think what you're doing is so important and people don't realize it. And even just to tie this in locally, you know, 3M is based in the Twin Cities and there's been a lot in the press here, I'm sure everywhere, but you know, our local papers as well because of the lawsuits and litigation related to PFAS. And I bet, you know, Marnie and I have talked about PFAS on this. We had a whole episode actually talking about it with someone, but I would say the average person probably doesn't know what that is or what, certainly not what products the PFAS most chemicals people, could be in. Yeah. Most people, I would say, it's probably a very small mm -hmm. percentage that know. So yeah. what you're doing and the, the, all the water, I mean, there's been lots of cities around the country, right? That talk about the chemicals in the water and the health implications. So I just want to commend you for everything you're doing. Like everyone needs to listen to this episode. Um, and it's scary. And you're right. Like we all know someone that has cancer and every day, it seems like you're finding out whether it's a friend of a friend or someone, a few circles removed from your friends who, you know, healthy individual, like, right. Is eating well, is exercising, like taking care of themselves and they're getting cancer and like maybe stage three cancer, not even just like early onset cancer. So it's scary. And it's something that I think everyone needs to be focused. And one of the things that I read in your book that I found so astonishing is that only seven to nine percent of global cancer funding goes towards prevention, and the rest all goes to treatment and cures. And this is a really, I think, gets to the root of like why we're not winning the war on cancer, mm -hmm. and why you're proposing this new, this new shift. But why does society focus more on curing cancer versus preventing cancer? Yeah, thank you for asking about that. I think there are a couple reasons that we're. Um, so much of the funding goes toward 
treatments and cures. And I just want to emphasize that obviously treatments and cures are valuable and worth spending lots of money on. Um, that's what saved my sister's life. And I'm so grateful that we had them. So I would never say we should do less of that, but I, I do believe that, um, we're missing a huge opportunity to prevent cancer by spending so little on, uh, cancer prevention initiatives. And, uh, one of the reasons it is that way <laughs> is that, um, people can make a whole lot of money on investing in cancer treatments and cures. When you look at, uh, the market projections for the global oncology market, you know, they say that cancer rates are expected to continue to climb between now and 2040, which indicates strong growth for this market. So mm -hmm. people who invest in uh, better treatments stand to make a whole lot of money and nobody stands to get rich from investing in cancer prevention, unfortunately. So a solution isn't going to just naturally emerge from the marketplace or from some brilliant entrepreneur who comes along. Um, the only other option is regulations and policies and government action to try and reduce the number of chemicals we're exposed to. And then, um, so it's estimated that 90 to 95% of all cancer cases are from preventable causes, which is kind of astonishing. 90 to 95%, very few cancers are the result of only something going on genetically. Um, almost all of them involve you know, a genetic predisposition um, in combination with something that happens in the environment. And that also includes lifestyle behaviors, you know, smoking, uh, exercise, diet, but that little seven to 9% of funding that goes toward cancer prevention that you mentioned um, is almost entirely focused on those lifestyle behaviors, right? Whenever you see something or hear like a PSA about cancer prevention, it's always focused on not smoking, uh, improving your diet, lowering stress, getting more exercise. And those things are important and they're worth doing because they benefit our health in lots of ways, right? Beyond just uh, lowering our risk for cancer. But you mentioned that, you know, you hear more and more from people who think they're making all the right choices and they're still getting cancer. And I talked to an oncologist uh, when I was writing the book who told me a story about meeting a young man who had recently been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he was a cross country runner. He ate super clean and healthy. He had never smoked in his life and he was furious. He felt like he'd been lied to. He felt like he'd mm -hmm. been told that he could control his health if he made all the right choices. And that then he was learning that that just wasn't true. And so a lot of the kind of big uh, systemic risk factors for cancer are the ones that we're ignoring and not addressing, even though addressing them um, could reduce cancer risk for a ton of people all at once, right? Um, as opposed to like just telling everyone for the millionth time that they shouldn't smoke cigarettes. Well, and I also just want to point out that you know, I think a lot of us think that if we eat healthy and we exercise and we do all of those things, we're not going to get cancer unless you have some family history or something. And I, I think people don't consider those environmental factors. It's like almost so out there in the world, like what's the word I'm looking for? It's just, it's, it's, it's not concrete. Like you can't mm -hmm. pinpoint exactly what it is. And so it almost doesn't seem like worth considering. I mean, I know it's worth considering and we all, we all three know that, but I think the general public does focus on those few things you mentioned. And as I listen to you talk, I almost feel like disheartened because it's like, okay, if these are the things we can control and, you know, you can't really control your city water and you can't control the air you breathe and you can't, you know, it's like everything is scary, right? Like the cosmetics yeah. and the plastics and you know, this is leaching into this and this is, you know, the mattresses have off gassing and it's like, what in the world can we do <laughs> to live a life that, you know, potentially isn't going to give us cancer when our whole world is bombarding us with all these chemicals constantly. It's like, 
it's just so frustrating. And I know that legislation is the answer, right? And getting the word out there to people to even understand that all of these things are a problem, but you also like don't want to scare everybody. So it's like, how do you, how do you find that balance? And, you know, I know you share a lot of stories in your book and maybe you could share a story of, you know, how we can shed some light on this and not scare so many people. Yeah, you're right. This can feel really overwhelming and really scary to learn that there are all these things that are kind of um, beyond your ability to exercise and eat healthy and not smoke, right? That are raising your cancer risk. And um, when we were talking about, you know, why so much funding goes toward treatments, I think one of the other reasons it's tricky to advocate for prevention is that Uh, it's the nature of prevention that we don't get to know whose cancer we prevented. We don't get to know whose life we saved. We're not going to get a hug from a mom saying, thank you so much for preventing cancer in my daughter or my son. Um, And so it can be a lot harder to make that feel concrete. You're saying, you're saying that the risks can feel abstract, but also prevention can feel really abstract. And when we talk about cancer prevention, it tends to be in terms of um, like long-term statistical analysis and trends and data. And that stuff is really important and really significant, but it's also harder to connect to emotionally, right? When we're asking people to help pitch in for treatments and we can put the picture of a a little boy who's battling cancer on a t-shirt and on a Facebook page, it's easy to feel empathy and want to pitch in and connect. Um, and so that's part of the reason that I, Told that my book is framed through profiles of people who have devoted their lives to this work. So when I was first learning about this issue, I also felt really overwhelmed and freaked out and it made me feel um, kind of hopeless. But then I found that as I was meeting people who've made it their life's work to try and find solutions to this problem. Um, And I learned about their work and also like the stories about their family histories and their education and what drives them in this work every day. Um, That made me feel a lot more hopeful. That made me feel like, oh, wow, there are really brilliant people who've been working on this for decades and they've had all these wins that helped make me and my family safer that I didn't even know about. And so um, I wanted to, I hope that readers have the same experience. I wanted to tell their stories. And so there is some data and there are some statistics and some big numbers in the book. Um, But the book is really based in the stories of these people who are, you know, every day working to try and make our world safer. And um, one of them that I find particularly moving is... Um, the story of Melanie Mead, who is a clean air activist who lives in Clareton, Pennsylvania, which is close to where I am here in Pittsburgh. And um, that community is home to a steel plant that uh, regularly violates clean air laws. And the town has some of the dirtiest air in the country on a pretty regular basis as a result. And Melanie, um, who grew up there, uh, her family owned farmland in Clareton for generations, like long before the steel company came to town. And then once the steel mill came to town, most of the men in her family worked there at some point, either for summer jobs or for their whole careers. Um, a handful of the women in her family worked there too. And, um, Melanie was one of four kids and over an eight year period, she lost all of her siblings and both of her parents to either cancer or respiratory disease or heart disease. So she was one in a family of six and now it's just her. She's the only person still living. And right after her parents both died within like six months of each other, she found out um, she attended like a clean air meeting um, that that activists were holding in the town. And she learned for the first time about the role that pollution from this industrial site 
was probably, you know, had probably played in her parents' health um, and the ways it was impacting the community. Her brother had had childhood asthma at a time when um, treatments were a lot less readily available. And he, he had to go to the emergency room with um, like severe asthma attacks a number of times. And it had never occurred to her that it might be connected to pollution from the plant. The kind of common line in the town was that those big plumes of smoke coming out of the smokestacks um, that's just steam. <laughs> We're told that's just steam, which is Ugh, absolutely wow. not true. Oh my gosh. Um, they're making coke at that plant. So they're heating coal to extremely high temperatures. And those are some of the most carcinogenic industrial right. emissions that exist. They're linked to asthma and cancer and heart disease and all kinds of other health problems. And so after learning about this, about how bad the air pollution was, and that it was all coming from this one place, more or less, um, Melanie became an activist and she started um, I met her at a press conference when I was there covering something, a fire that had happened at the plant that had broken pollution controls and subjected this community to really high levels of pollution. Um, I saw her getting in front of the cameras and telling her family's story and you know, pleading with local officials to do more to protect the community. And in the years since then, she's organized you know, countless clean air rallies. She's told her family's story in public testimony to local and state politicians, um, including former governor Tom Wolf. And um, thanks to advocacy by Melanie and lots of other activists like her, um, the local health department that oversees air quality has stepped up its enforcement of clean air laws, specifically in that community in the last couple of years. Um, so they're issuing bigger fines and they've enacted some new policies where if the air quality is really bad and the weather looks like it'll trap pollution close to the ground, they can um, require the company to reduce their emissions for a while. And uh, U.S. Steel in the last year shut down the three oldest, dirtiest Coke ovens at the plant in part because of all of this public pressure. So you know, those changes are slow and they're not going to totally solve all of that town's problems. But um, it, it's been really meaningful for me to see that change does happen, even if it's not as quickly as, as we'd like. And also, I think Melanie's story is particularly moving to me because I know um, there are so many people like her across in communities across the United States and around the world who are um, facing pollution in their communities and they're up against these really impossible odds. They're battling huge corporations. And instead of just moving away, they stay and they fight for their communities' right to breathe clean air and drink clean water. And um, so most of the other people profiled in the book are like researchers or people who lead NGOs or um, people who uh, are lobbyists who lobby for better chemical regulations. And um, Melanie is one of just a couple activists who are really profiled in the book, but um, I find her story just so inspiring. She's such a um, resilient person and it's so... Uh, yeah, I think it makes it feels empowering that if she can keep working on this issue after all that she's been through, um, then certainly I can find some ways to pitch into. Yeah, it's so moving. And it does give you hope all these examples that you shared in the book. And I, there were organizations and things that people were doing that I wasn't aware of. Um, and I do and you know, the one point that you bring up out a couple times in the book is just how, you know, in some of these communities where like you mentioned this town in Pennsylvania and others, it's a lot of like poor communities that end up being closer to these plants. And, you know, quite honestly, they may be employed at the plant. They can't just pick up and move mm -hmm. because the air isn't yeah. clean. Like economically, that's not probably feasible. And they're under, you know, they're underserved, like, and they may not be able to right. also like buy these more expensive products that are BPA free and phylate free and right. all this. Right or the organic produce without the pesticides. So I love that you're really making this, this is an issue for everyone and it has to be done at the grassroots level from a policy standpoint so that everyone is benefiting, not just those that can make those small choices. And that's only a, a piece of it. And I think up until now, I mean, I guess I think we all know that policy is important, but a lot of times we're just focused on our families or what we can do individually or within our small community and it's the hard work that you and others are doing, quite frankly, a lot harder than 
donating to a cancer cure, right? And just send some money or participate in a race. This is really the work, but this is really the important work that needs to be done. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Some of the researchers I talked to in the book also emphasized that, um, you know, even when you can afford to buy all the right products and eat organic and make all those um, individual choices you referred to, and even for people who have a PhD in organic chemistry and study this every day and kind of know all the stuff to avoid, they're saying that even with all those tools, I know that I can't totally protect my family from these, from harmful chemicals that can raise our cancer risk because they're um, just so ubiquitous. They're just everywhere. So it's not just about, um, you know, protecting the people who don't have the capacity to make those healthier individual choices. It's really an issue where we're kind of all in this together, right? Where all of us are protected or none of us are. So with that being said, like based on your research and interviewing so many different people, what are some steps that people can actually start to take to limit their exposure exposure <laughs> to cancer causing chemicals? Yeah, so some of the some of the easiest things you can do are um, getting investing in a really good water filter in your home. Uh, there are, there was a study a couple of years ago that estimated that a hundred thousand cancer cases can be attributed to carcinogens in American tap water, which is a very alarming number. Um, our federal drinking water regulation and for the most part, haven't been updated in 20 or 30 years. And so there are lots of substances that just aren't even being tested for um, that we know can raise our cancer risk in tap water um, and substances that we just haven't got around to regulating yet, like PFAS, which we've been talking about a little bit. Um, the EPA is working on drinking water standards for a couple of PFAS, but that's been in progress for years. And in the meantime, you know, 45% of Americans have this stuff in their tap water and we're all just drinking it. So, um, can, can, I, can, couple... just, can I, yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. you clarify for everyone what a PFAS chemical is? Cause we yeah. probably only talked about it once. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We keep mentioning it. Yeah. Uh, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoralkyl substances, which is a mouthful, which is why everyone just uses that acronym. And this is a class of more than 15,000 chemicals that have similar chemical properties and they don't break down naturally. So they're sometimes called forever chemicals. And because they don't break down, they can build up in soil and water and plants and animals and in our bodies and cause lots of health problems, um, including raising our risk for certain types of cancer, including uh, thyroid disease, obesity, um, fertility problems, and risk for miscarriage and birth defects. So um, these chemicals are a big problem. Oh, they're also, I should say, PFAS are used to make stuff nonstick and grease proof and stain resistant. So mm -hmm. they might be on a uh, stain proof carpet or couch and they're used in nonstick cookware. They're used to make clothing waterproof. Um, recently testing has found them in some like contact lenses and makeup and hair products. So we, these chemicals are very widely used and scientists have known for many decades that they could cause health problems. Um, but governments are just kind of becoming aware of the scale of this problem um, and starting to regulate them. So a handful of states have started um, banning these in certain consumer products and um, hopefully we'll see some more legislation related to PFAS in the next couple of years at the federal level too. Um, okay. And Can then... we go back to the water also for a second? Yes. Thank so you. <laughs> I feel like we could do a whole podcast on clean drinking water because yeah. people have so many questions about this. I, I have a reverse osmosis filter. Mm -hmm. I've been told that's good. I don't know if that's the best. It's, it's so confusing. You know, some people use the Brita which you can just buy at Target, like, but it's like at the point where like my city puts out a report every year on what's in the water, but they're not even, like you said, testing for things that we know is in the water. Okay. So yeah. 
the reverse osmosis is basically taking everything out of the water, right? I, I believe yeah. that from what yeah. I understand, but what, it, what is the best way? And like, when you're in a restaurant, are you drinking bottled water then? Because then it's from a plastic bottle or maybe it's from glass or are you just bringing your own water that you have filtered wherever you go? Like it's the water stresses me out. Like I uh-huh. feel, str- I'm trying to do the best job I can drinking clean water. Cause I know water is a huge problem, but mm-hmm. it's like, how, how do you do that? Like, yeah. Can you shed some light on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so filtering your water at home is one of the simplest things you can do to lower your exposure to lots of harmful chemicals and a reverse osmosis filter is great. Um, they capture most pollutants. Um, the only, the only challenge with them is that they can be cost prohibitive. They can be really expensive, especially if you're looking at like a whole house filter, they can be a little more reasonable if you just want to do a filter at the kitchen sink. Um, and but do you think there's... that's sufficient? Like I, I think Stephanie has her whole house, but like, we just have the kitchen. We have like for yeah. cooking and ice cubes um, but the right. rest of my house so, does not have it. Yeah. So I think it's always about, um, you know, with all of these things, it's never about being perfect. It's always about doing the things that are accessible to you kind of wherever you can that, you know, will lower your overall exposure. So it's not about, um, never drinking a drop of unfiltered water, right? It's just about, are there a couple steps we can take that are going to, um, have us mostly drinking water that we know is free of these pollutants. So I do know that, um, some of our exposure to some of these chemicals happens in the shower because, uh, pollutants get aerosolized in steam and then we're inhaling them. Hmm. So a whole house filter might not be a bad idea. Yeah, especially if you know that you're in an area that's dealing with PFAS contamination or where um, you know you have other contaminants in your water that you're concerned about. And there's a really good database, um, the Environmental Working Group, which is a nonprofit research Mm -hmm. and advocacy group focused on toxic chemicals. They Mm -hmm. do a national tap water database that they pull from those public notices that water authorities send out and you can put in your zip code. It'll tell you all the pollutants that are in your water, which ones are above um, health guidelines. And then they'll also show you which water filters take out those particular pollutants. I know the same group um, did recently tested, I think they tested 10 brand of the most popular brands of home like pitcher filters to see which ones removed PFAS and they found three brands that removed 98 to 100 percent of PFAS and they were um, a zero water filter a brand called clearly filtered and a brand called Berkey travel and that one's like a travel water filter murky um, did you say murky yeah B E. I i think it's B E R K E Y. yeah Berkey. Berkey. i know yeah i know the Berkey. yeah i yeah. said murky <laughs> Berkey with a b yeah, um yeah, yeah. and then i think they list one more that was a little lower like 95 percent or something um but those are generally available at target at walmart like i know you mm-hmm. can find a zero filter um most of them are available on amazon if you want to order it online um so if, you know, a whole house reverse osmosis system is cost prohibitive, um, or, you know, you're just not able to do it yet, then getting a good home pitcher filter is a really good place to start. Um, another big thing we can do is filter our indoor air and, uh, HEPA filter works best. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think of air pollution as an outdoor problem, but Americans spend, like 95% of our time indoors and outdoor pollutants can get trapped indoors, but then also from like cleaning products and gas stoves and, um, you know, other like household personal care products, indoor air pollution can actually be much worse than outdoor air pollution, especially in the winter when we're kind of sealing our houses up, at least in places where we have cold climates. Mm -hmm. So filtering your indoor air periodically can go a really long way toward helping with that. HEPA filters are best, but they can be expensive. 
but there's a really cool DIY version where you fit a, a HEPA filter, just the filter part into a box fan. And if you Google um, have to HEPA filter box fan, the instructions come right up. And there are a couple versions of that ranging from like a really simple one to slightly more complex ones that do a, a better, a little bit of a better job or more efficient filters. Um, and then just running those periodically once a week overnight on a bad air day um, can really help reduce your exposure to airborne pollutants that can raise your cancer risk while you're at home. And then personal care products is another big category. Um, and again, as we talk about all this, I always want to emphasize that it's really not fair that we all have to do this and worry about this, especially for moms who are generally making the health decisions for their families and who are busy and already have enough on our plates. Um, so we really need to push our lawmakers to do a better job of regulating these chemicals. So it's not all up to us as individuals. And then also that, again, it's not about being perfect. It's just about doing the steps that are accessible and kind of easy for you um, to kind of help reduce your overall exposure. Cause it's lots of little tiny exposures over time that can add up, right? So the more we can just reduce them in various parts of our lives, the better. So when it comes to cosmetics and personal care products, um, it can be really tough to just try and scan ingredient lists um, because sometimes chemicals aren't listed. So for example, um, sometimes an ingredient list will just say fragrance and fragrance can have like dozens of ingredients in it. They often have phthalates, which are endocrine disrupting chemicals that are typically used in perfume and fragrance to make them last longer, makes sense linger on our skin and on our hair. Um, so sometimes stuff isn't listed. Sometimes like formaldehyde isn't usually listed in hair care products, ingredient lists, but there are common ingredients in hair care products that combine and release formaldehyde when they're heated. So if you're heat styling mm -hmm. your hair, you could be. So I find a much easier option than trying to like memorize stuff to avoid um, is to use like, there are a couple of really good third-party um, databases and programs out there that just like verify products as non-toxic. And so instead of throwing everything away and starting over, which can feel really overwhelming. How I personally have done this is um, when I'm running low on something and I'm about to run out of something, I just use that as an opportunity to make a non-toxic upgrade. And yep. um, there's a Chrome extension called Clearia, C-L-E-A-R-Y-A, -A, um, that like if you're shopping for something, can pull up information on whether it contains toxic ingredients or not. Um, the one I personally like to use is the Environmental Working Group's Healthy Living app. Um, that's an app you can put on your phone and you can scan barcodes with it, um, which can be helpful, but they don't always have everything you're looking at in the database. So I find it easiest to just go in there and type mascara or shampoo or whatever I'm looking for. And then um, they'll, there will always be a handful that they've given like their seal of approval that it's free of a list of, you know, a hundred toxic, potentially harmful ingredients. And then I just pick one that they've already stamped as okay. Um, and if I try it and I don't like it, I try a different one the next time I'm out. Um, and so have I think you that heard of, this, I just mm -hmm. want to interrupt you for a second. There's another one that I use quite a bit called think dirty. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I've heard of that one. Yeah. Do you like yeah, that one? I haven't I tried do. it. I do. I like it a lot. And the only you... thing about that one though, is a lot of times you can't get all the information. You have to like pay. So they changed oh, I've it. I've never had to pay. No, I have never paid, but if you want like, more information. Like I just information used it for... with my daughter when we were at Target the other day, yeah. we didn't have to pay for anything. Like it gave us the number and. It's yeah. happened to me quite a few times. So I end up huh. using EWG more as well. Yeah, anyway, okay. it's a, just anyway, another option. It's another option. Yeah. I've never. And then okay. another one is um, Made Safe. Made Safe has a big database of, um, you know, less toxic options. And they're a really good, like, third party approval system. So if it has a Made Safe seal of approval, um, it generally means it's free of a bunch of harmful ingredients. There's There are also a couple of online marketplaces. Um, mm -hmm. There's one. I'm thinking of that's called black and green. And I think it's just um, B-L-C-K-G-R-N. Um, but that is a marketplace of products, particularly for um, black women and women, women of color. 
uh, that sells products made by black owned businesses that are all, you know, in order to sell on the site, they have to be free of a long list of toxic ingredients. Mm. And they have like skincare, hair care. They also have like candles and baby stuff and home goods. And I've bought a number of things from that site that I've really liked. That's um, really and cool. Then, and we will link all this up yeah. in the show notes for people. Too. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are some of the big categories where, you know, I think there are some relatively easy steps we can take to reduce our overall exposure. Um, another one that can be helpful for parents to think about is, um, you know, our kids are out of the house a lot of the day. So we can be thinking a lot about what they're exposed to at home, but um, they may be facing potentially harmful exposures in daycare or in school. And one of the things I wrote about in the book is this national program um, called the Eco Healthy Child Care Program that is a voluntary program for daycares and early learning centers where they follow, I think they have to do like 30 out of 35 possible um low cost or free measures that can reduce toxic chemicals. And then they get verified as a eco healthy childcare center and they can advertise that. So right now it's voluntary. The people who run that program are hoping that it'll become, you know, that if you want to be accredited, you would have to do something like that. But it's things like, um, you know, minimizing the use of bleach, which can, which can be harmful mm -hmm. for kids. And there are a lot of sterilization requirements at daycares. So a lot of daycares, without thinking about it, just kind of regularly blanket everything in bleach, which is not great for tiny lungs and skin and bodies. So minimizing the use of bleach and finding gentler options for sterilization and cleaning. Um, it includes stuff like, you know, making sure you're not using lead-based paints and don't have um, toys that contain lead, making sure that cars and buses aren't idling. Diesel exhaust can be really harmful for kids and it can build up in areas if there's like a line of cars waiting. Um, it includes things like minimizing the use of pesticides on the playground and indoors. Um, so one thing you can do is find a daycare that is certified with something like that. Although as far as I know, this is the only program um, there are a lot of good um, programs for elementary schools, but as far as I know, this is the only one doing this for daycares. So you could find a, a daycare that's certified. You could also ask your kid's daycare to get certified. You could go mm -hmm. in and say, hey, I've been learning about this cool program and I think it's really interesting and you could pass on some information. And then, um, you know, if your kids are in elementary school or up, um, the EPA has a really good healthy schools program that has a lot of these same kinds of tips and guidelines um, and options for school boards to make sure that kids aren't being exposed to harmful chemicals while they're in school. Okay. This is so awesome. Like what a great, great resource. And I know we're starting to run out of time, but one question I really wanted to talk about our topic I wanted you to discuss a little bit is just the fact that I came across when I was researching for this interview today with the alarming rates of childhood cancer. Um, and just you, you brought up kids and it just triggered this in my head. Like why, why do you think so many children are so vulnerable to cancer than ever before? You know, a lot of times yeah. it's like things that we do later, like the smoking or the drinking or the not taking care of yourself, but like, that's clearly not the case for all these young kids. Right. So all those lifestyle behaviors we've talked about aren't generally aren't factors for kids, right? They're not smoking. They're not drinking. They tend to like exercise. Um, parents might be smoking and drinking during pregnancy, but over time, the percentage of parents who do that has decreased as awareness of the risks of those things has increased. But childhood cancer rates have been steadily climbing since we started um, collecting data back in the seventies. So over the last 50 years, the charts for childhood cancer just go diagonal across the page. And, um, you know, there are lots of potential reasons for this, but one of the things that has changed in the last 50 years is the quantity of endocrine disrupting chemicals and carcinogens that we're all exposed to on a regular basis. So, um, you know, there's a, a really smart pediatrician and epidemiologist named Dr. Phil Landrigan, who wrote the foreword in my book. And he basically says, like, kids are the canaries in the coal mine here. So kids are more vulnerable than adults are to these kinds of exposures um, for their 
the size of their bodies, kids eat more, drink more, breathe more in proportion to their body size compared to adults. They also are, are still developing their most complex bodily systems. And that requires healthy hormonal systems. And it requires, you know, many intricate steps to happen all in precise order. So if something gets into their bodies that disrupts any of that, it can create problems, including elevated cancer risk. And there's also some evidence that um, our exposure to some of these chemicals can increase the risk of disease for our children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. So it's also possible that, you know, um, some of these childhood cancer cases are in part the result of exposures that their grandmothers or great grandmothers had to. Um, is that, you is know, that? For to interrupt you, but is that because when they're carrying during pregnancy, they're exposed to certain things and then it's being passed down through the baby or? So this research is all kind of new, but the, I, I believe the thinking is that um, some of these exposures can cause like genetic changes and genetic mutations okay. that are passed down that wow. can increase wow. the risk of disease. Yeah. So, um, and, and again, that research is all pretty new. Um, and initially it was just animal studies that showed that, but more recently um, there was a study that looked at the pesticide DDT uh, before mm -hmm. it was banned and found that um among women who were exposed to DDT, their granddaughters had higher risk of developing breast cancer in adulthood than- Wow. Right. So it was like a multi-generational study and it was kind of the first to say, hey, we think that some of these risks can be multi-generational and we should be thinking about that. And certainly that's true of um, endocrine disrupting chemicals too, that, that there are concerns about multi-generational effects. So- um, you know, because kids are more vulnerable to these exposures, because it looks like maybe some of these risks are getting passed down and because, um, children also, because they're not fully developed yet, they're less capable than adults of, you know, eliminating toxic substances that make their way into their bodies because, um, you know, not their, this bodily systems that do that just aren't fully formed yet. So, the rise in childhood cancer rates, um, some experts really think that that is signaling that this is a problem for all of us, right? That this is a global mm -hmm. problem, that this um, is a multi-generational problem, and that if we want to tackle rising cancer rates among kids, we have to do more to focus on prevention, specifically by reducing our exposure to these kinds of pollutants. And I know um, before we jumped into this question, you were talking about the ways that we can do that. And I think we covered four of them. Will you share with our audience the fifth one? One other thing I write about in the book that we can do to help minimize our exposure to these chemicals is thinking about healthy building materials. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a category that uh, I think a lot of us tend not to think about. Um but the materials used to build our homes and our schools and our offices and the buildings where we spend our days, um, a lot of the materials that go into building these structures are hazardous. And sometimes some of them can off gas and uh, residents' health can be affected. But also um, it's important to think about you know, the health risks kind of all the way through the supply chain. So if we're using something like formaldehyde in building material, um, formaldehyde is a known carcinogen, and then it's exposing people, workers at the plant, people in the community at the plant that manufactures formaldehyde. It's uh, potentially impacting contractors when they're using materials that are treated with formaldehyde. And then it's potentially impacting people who are spending time in these buildings. And then eventually when, you know, if a building is demolished, then those chemicals can still hang around. They can get into the soil and into a landfill and into groundwater. So um, there's this whole life cycle for the materials that we use in our buildings. And uh, we can have impacts as just like residents of a house where these 
these chemicals are used, but it's a much bigger challenge than that. And um, there are some programs that are working to increase transparency about these products. It's really tough because when you go to buy like paint or something, you know, they don't require an ingredient list in the same way that cosmetics do. So it's, it can be really tough as a consumer to pick something healthy. And it can even be tough if you're a contractor or an architect who wants to use healthy building materials. Um, but there are some really good resources out there that can help. And the big one I wrote about in the book is called the Healthy Building Network. And they've done a lot of work to figure out um, what types of chemicals are used in building materials, which ones are harmful, at which stage of their life cycle, are they the most harmful and are there healthy alternatives available? So if you're about to do a home renovation, um, this is something you can ask your, the, a contractor you work with to think about. Um, you could point them towards some resources for picking healthier materials. And this is another one where it can be really easy to get obsessive, and like go down the rabbit <laughs> right. hole because it's kind of tricky to find answers. And there's some greenwashing that goes on in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're able to find a contractor in your area, who's kind of familiar with the idea of healthy building materials, or you can provide some resources, like pointing them toward the healthy building network, um, you know, then then it's again about rather than being perfect kind of overall harm reduction. So saying like, well, you know, maybe that particular product is too expensive, but I think it's really important that we not be using PFAS treated carpets. So let's put the budget there. Um, so you can, you know, use tools like that to make some of those choices that can be helpful in the long run. And that's, that's different than helpful. a LEED certification. Which it, are you familiar with LEED certification, which is more about sustainability, right? Not necessarily yeah, not so health for the I've, people, but health for the environment. That's right. I, so I wrote about this some in the book, but um, the Healthy Building Network folks were involved in the formulation of the LEED certification standards. And they were really, really pushing for LEED standards to include healthy building materials and that you could get credits for using non-toxic building materials. And um, there was a lot of pushback from the industry because no one wants to have their product perceived as toxic. You know, they all mm -hmm. kind of will acknowledge that like energy, energy efficiency is important and you can be more or less energy efficient, but they're like, consumers are just not going to buy our product if it's ranked as toxic. So um, there are some some uh, lead certification points that are related to toxic chemicals, but they're generally lower value than like energy efficiency points. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to get lead certified, it's a lot easier to do the energy efficiency stuff and then get an adequate number of points. So a lot of times people just kind of ignore the healthy building mm -hmm. portions, but there are programs like lead um, that do include you know, safe, healthy building materials. Um, a lot of them are kind of more popular outside the United States, but there mm -hmm. are communities and organizations in the United States that are using those to say, you know, we actually built a building that helps the environment and it adds green space to the community and it filters water and it's healthy building materials. So I think we're seeing a shift where um, people are kind of more generally aware of this and want want to be spend time in healthier buildings. No one wants to think that the building you're spending your days in is making you sick. Right. So right. I think we're seeing a, a bit of a shift. Um, but it is one of those things where um, a lot of the advocacy work being done right now is around increased transparency because it can be really tough to figure out what's in building materials if this is something you care about, but don't have, you know, endless resources to research on your own. Yeah. I mean, Christina, this conversation has just, I feel like, touched the surface on all these really important areas. We may need to have you come back on to dive deep into some of these. Um, and I know we're running out of time here, so we want to make sure people know where to find you, where can they find your book. We're also going to do a giveaway for everyone so that you can get a copy of The New War on Cancer, which I highly recommend. And the other thing I just wanted to say for our listeners is we've touched on some of these topics in a little bit more detail in other episodes. And we'll link up all those in the show notes. So we have a whole episode on PFAS and we have an episode on some of like the beauty and personal care products and household cleaners. And those may be other good resources for you guys to listen to if you're interested in this topic further. So I just thought I'd share that. But anyway, Great. where can and people I be, find you? I would be happy to come back sometime. <laughs> Great. So where, where can, can people, people find, find you? you? So I'm, uh, my website is 
kristinamarusic.com. That's K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-M-A-R-U-S-I-C. Or you can also go to newwaroncancer.com. It goes to the same website. I'm on Twitter at Christina Writes, which is K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-W-R-I-T-E-S. And I'm on Instagram under my full first and last name. Great. That's great. And we'll link all that up in the show notes. And Christina, and we will we... do, sorry, just to mention the book giveaway. When this episode comes out, it'll be on Instagram. But for those of you not on Instagram, send us an email if you want to be included in that giveaway and we'll include you in the drawing as well. And Christina, as we wrap up this conversation, one question we'd like to ask all of our guests is what does the art of living well mean to you? To me, being able to live well means having access to clean air to breathe, safe, clean water to drink, healthy food to eat, and then also um, having the freedom to you know, be able to buy products from the store and have confidence that they're safe. Um, to me, that would take us a lot closer to letting everyone be able to live well. And that feels like a bare minimum. <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot more to living well than that. I think, you know, living well to me also means living a life where I spend lots of time with my loved ones and the people I care about most are able to live happy, healthy lives. Um, yeah. And I think uh, having a, a safer world would get us all a lot closer to that. It seems like that should be so simple, right? Like Amen. clean yeah. air, clean water, clean food, like the yeah. basics, yet we're, we've messed it all up. We have to, you know, we have to go back and put it. I mean, yeah, we literally we, have, we to have to go to back in time, untangle the mess and put it all back together. Yeah. I know it's, it's easy a to lot think that, of people it? You're to like, do that. Oh, wait, when we were just like nomads, we had all of that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. totally. So it's like with so you. many advancements, we've gone backwards in so many ways, but that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. This has been so enlightening and we're not trying to scare anybody. We just want to bring awareness to this really important topic and know that as consumers, you know, like Stephanie often says, when you make your purchases, you're letting the companies know which companies you want to support and you don't want to support. So yeah. keep that Vote in mind. Vote with your dollar. Yeah. And I would add to that when you're shopping with your dollar, if you take a few extra minutes just to tell both companies why mm -hmm. you made the switch, you can really amplify that impact. Um, that. Companies really rarely hear from consumers anymore. And so especially if you do it in a public forum, like on social media, but even in an email, if you say, hey, I've used this hand cream for my whole life. It's always been my favorite hand cream and I'm going to stop using it because it contains harmful ingredients. Um, they tend to really take note of that. So you can amplify Amplify the impact of shopping with your dollar by taking a few extra minutes to let both companies know why you made the switch. You know what? Thank you for mentioning that because I did read that in your book and I've heard that before and I'm not good about doing that. And honestly, sometimes on social media, I feel like I don't want to bash the company. Like I give the props to the company whose brand I'm using, but yeah, I don't want to yeah. like either be judging other people that use the brand, but you're right. Actually, right. it's more, they don't want that publicity. So maybe I will yeah. start to kind of do that, but you're right. Send a quick note. You know, there's probably a form. Yeah, even in a private send. email, I think, right. the, you mm -hmm. know, they tend to take note when they start yeah. hearing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. There's so much good information and lots of tips for everyone. So. Well, yeah. it was so nice to meet you and thank you for coming on today. And we wish you a, enjoy the weather you're having. Have a nice oh, thank day. you. Yeah, it was so nice to meet both of you too. Thank you for such thoughtful questions. I really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. Have a great one. You too. Thanks.